How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Wine and Cheese. Uh, it's a special holiday edition. Uh, the way I'm looking at it, it's kind of a little early Christmas present for myself because I'm getting to sit down with a, a good buddy of mine that I really look up to. Um, guy from, I call it my hometown because Louisiana is just, it's one town in itself. Just an all-around badass and a beautiful human being, Mr. Mark Broussard. Hello. How you doing, my friend? Doing well, brother. Thanks for having me. Man, I'm, I was... I've been trying to get you to do this for a while, and it was, it was, I got excited the other day when I finally got with your tour manager, Chad, and we locked it down. Um, I, 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 it's been a goal of mine to get down and sit down and talk with you for a while. I know, we've been while. going back and forth on this for a little while. I'm glad we finally put it on. Have you off. ever actually watched or listened to the show? I have, yeah. what I do? Yeah, absolutely. And you still agreed to be on it. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did. <laughs> Well, I've listened good, to a man. few episodes. It's been good. Hopefully, this one will go a little bit different than last night. Last night, uh, my, my co-star had me wrapped up in duct tape with a plastic bag on my head, uh, making me drink beer. Well, that uh, sounds like a regular Thursday night it was, for you guys. So it really on. was. Come I on. got two out of Tell five, I, I guess the Natty Light. Um, what I wanted to start with, man, is it's, we're, we're sitting down and we're talking. It's, it's coming on a new year. And I know, personally, I'm finding myself being in a spot where it just makes you reflect even though you don't want to or you're not even trying to reflect. Um, so this time of the year, it's, it's making me think about the people who aren't here anymore, uh, where I was a year ago and where I am now. <clears throat> Does it have the same effect on you? Do you reflect at the end of the year and start thinking about what you did with yourself for a year? No, not typically. Uh... Although this year is a little different. I started blogging recently. Yeah, I just and, heard you talking about that. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going into some deep dives about my personal life and, and my relationship with my wife. And so I have been doing a bit of, uh, a bit of you know, thinking back on, on the early days in, in my marriage and my career. And, uh, but currently, man, I, I'm focused more than ever on the future, to be honest. Yeah, and that's that's great, yeah. right? Because that's where you want to be. Absolutely. That's where I feel like I want to be. A year ago, there's no way I could think about the future. Now, like I could, I could see a glimpse of it. Yeah. But you're talking about doing the blogging. Is this something that you, because I've been reading them, and they're really interesting. You know, Good. People that want to know about you, I think it's really interesting stuff. How are you balancing revealing stuff about your personal life and still keeping your personal life in check at home. Because I know me, every time we do a show and I end up talking about the girl I'm dating or something, it's always, there's always at least something back at home. No doubt. To no talk doubt. about when I get there. How, how, how do you handle that? So my wife is, has been kind of reserved and, and, uh, and a little nervous about some of the things that I've been writing. Uh, this latest series of blog posts that, that I haven't put up yet are specifically about the, the genesis of our relationship and, uh, and some of the uglier parts do come to light. Yeah. Uh, I was, you know, I make no bones about the fact that I was kind of a piece of shit boyfriend Yeah. Uh, for a, a really long I time. I think I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> you know, the truth is, man, I, I've always tried to be a fairly open and honest person. Yeah. Uh, in my music, I've, I've tried to be pretty open and honest as well uh, and write you know music that from a place uh, of knowledge you know writing that stuff that I know because um, what I would say is from the outside looking in fans of Mark Broussard would look at the records and they'd look at the songs and they'd listen to songs like honesty and you know the, everything that was on the last record of yeah. life worth living and they say oh here's a hopeless romantic who probably has the perfect relationship because he knows how to express himself but that's not always the case. No, it's not the case. What were you just talking about outside about the blog that you're writing right now about your second kid? So, so well, there's, there's this, this blog post is titled Loving Sonya, and it's broken into three parts. And okay. It's broken into those three parts because uh, we, we got married on our third pregnancy. We got married after we were pregnant for our third. And uh, the first two kind of go into detail about how we met in high school and... And then how I moved away right after high school, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, I go to Los Angeles shortly after we broke up. Uh, at around Christmas time, we broke up. I went to L.A. for my first ever trip out there to meet with a bunch of record executives. Yeah. And uh, I was there for a week. 
I called home to tell my mom all about how awesome the week was. My mom said, hey, your ex-girlfriend called. She wants you to call you. <laughs> call her up. So I, I called her mom. Her mom gave me the phone number of a fella she was hanging out with. I call his cell phone. And she, Sonia gets on the phone, and she was... Uh, you know, she had just taken a pregnancy test, and, and she was pregnant for my child. And y'all were broken up at the time. And we were split. Ooh, we, man. We, we had been split. What goes for, through your, like, is, honestly, is the initial reaction, no. The like, initial reaction was uh, oh, loud and vociferous. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To which she hung up on. No uh, shit. Yeah, she hung up on me, and I called her back. We, we ended up working things out, but I was still a piece of shit boyfriend. And I wasn't very supportive. And uh, about two and a half years go by, and uh, and we break up again right at, around Christmas time. And uh, this time it was for good. I mean, we were we were done. Done we deal. Were, we were. It was a done deal. And we had actually had that final. That final, you know, let's 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 have one more session together. Exactly. To like seal it up. Yep. That Man. that old exit, you know. What what is it? Just for, you know what, I, even the people watching, I don't even care. For me, because I feel like I'm going through what you're going through. What is it that you were doing if you could take some responsibility that was... I was called? lying and cheating, and I mean, I was doing all of the things that you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> Hanging out with the boys and leaving her and the baby at home. Is it because you thought you were entitled? I, I didn't necessarily think I was entitled. I just was unaware... Of, uh, of what I was doing, of how deeply she was being affected by what I was doing. Yeah. And I also didn't fully understand what it was like to, to, to actuate honest love. It took a long, long time for me to pay attention to what she was doing and the, the things that she would do, uh, her behavior towards me that demonstrated what somebody who professed love honestly really was supposed to do. Right, and you're so amazing at talking about it in your music that it's, because I could tell you, I, that's where I am kind of in my life. Like I, I, I've been, I was in a relationship and a marriage for 17 years, I'm divorced and now I'm trying to, and I realized that, wow, that, that, I may have ruined that myself and now I'm just realizing it. And that's one of the reasons that your music really sticks with me. I, I'll, I'll end up listening to the same songs over and over and mm -hmm. over again. Um, because they just they speak to me, and I feel no like this is where I'm at. No doubt. You know? um, so that that's interesting. So I'm 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 looking forward to more of those blogs. The, is that something loving that was, Sonya is going to be is, is going to be good? I'm right? very excited. about Is that it. something that was told? Hey, you got to do this, or did you? No. Uh, a friend reached out. And so he's actually uh, just a, a, a guy that I follow on Twitter, uh, who is a writer, and uh, he reached out uh, to to help me maybe launch a blog. He, he said, you know, I don't think that there's anybody in your business that's, that's really doing this kind yeah. of thing. Uh, and he works for a company called, uh, for a website called the Players Tribune, which is where professional athletes can go and, yeah. and, and kind of give things in their own words. And so what he was hoping that we could do is maybe at least create some sort of a template for, for that kind of a model in the music business. And so that's kind of where this whole thing started. It was an idea well, for... For me to start laying out the kinds of things that I that I'd like to see myself from myself and from my favorite artists, you know, we, I think that as artists we're we're designed, and and our purpose here is to tell stories, yeah, and to connect with people through those stories, and uh, I, I I don't necessarily find Twitter and Facebook uh, engaging enough proper mediums. Agreed. Uh, I also think that there are lots of artists out there that don't necessarily understand their role, yeah. maybe uh, the same way that I understand mine. That kind of leads me to what I wanted to talk about next. You spent a long time uh, being part of a major record labels. Mm -hmm. um, and how long has it been now that you're an independent artist That's on uh, your own? Two years almost. Two years. Yeah. Okay. So. From the outside looking in, it seems to me that you're flourishing as an independent artist. What's the pros and cons there? Are you happy you made that decision to jump out on your own? Oh, I couldn't be happier. And what what was what were you being held back before? So or what was what's different now? So I think that the the major label system, uh, in an attempt to employ the the market forces, they often will stagnate 
an artist's creative potential. Um, you know, in, in free market economics, if you have a product that you need to increase the price of, you can either reduce the flow into the market of that product or you can reduce production costs. Yeah. One of those two things is going to help you generate some profit. And so the major labels say, we can't really reduce production costs because that's the way we do things. Yeah. So we'll just stem the tide of music into the market. Except that one label can't control the broader stream of music into the market. And so it, it doesn't, it's a, it's, a, it's a theory that should work uh, in theory, but it doesn't in practicality. And what it, what it does is it puts artists uh, putting records out, you know, it, it has artists putting records out every couple of years as opposed to... And maybe when they're not ready. Uh, not, even, not even necessarily that. What happens is I recorded a record, I would get it mastered, the thing is done. Yeah. And then we take it to the label and then the label says, they take, so they take a look at their calendar and they say, okay, it's January now, but we don't have a hole in the release schedule until next February. So it sits on the shelf. So it sits on the shelf for a year and a half. Meanwhile, as a person and as an artist, I grow, I get inspired by other things and I move on, I move beyond that project. Yeah. So by the time that it comes out the following February, I'm over it. You're I'm not, done. You're not I'm even not the same person that wrote by that, that record. stuff at all. And so now that I'm independent, I feel like the chains have kind of been taken off in, in, in a way. And uh, I've never been more creative in my life, man. We, we put out a record in September, SOS 2. I've got another record, an all-original record coming in March. I've got a side what? project. <coughs> with, Southern uh, Soul Assembly? No, I've got another side project. Oh, really? With, with Brian McKnight Jr., actually. Really? Uh, and that, that I'm hoping to get off the ground before summertime with a few, uh, maybe a little EP. Uh, I'm working on trying to pull together some sort of a writer's retreat for young writers next summer, which will hopefully come with a release as well next fall. And then we're going to cut SOS 3 in February for release next Christmas. Man, that, that sounds awesome. You've definitely, it seems like the production just of the volume of what you're putting out has increased. Well, are we trying to write a hit? Always. Are we, so is, I was really curious about that. In your writing process, are you thinking, I am trying to write something that can give me commercial success? Absolutely, always. Really? But I'm also building, we've built a business model that does not require record sales. And that all. was my next question. It doesn't lean necessary. on that So it's Lanyap. Yeah. Every record that we sell is Lanya. Now, I do wish that we could sell more records. Yeah. I wish that we could sell, if we could sell 10,000 records, I would be able to launch my own label division and be able to start developing younger artists. We can't, I, I think we're not that, hitting that market I anymore. think that number would surprise people. That, because it used to be a million records was the minimum, Look, I right? used to make records for a half a million dollars. Yeah. And the way that the label math, the way that the record deals are structured, uh, it, it requires millions of records sold to be able to pay that money back. Essentially, I get a cut that says, when I sign a record deal, they give me a, a big old batch of money. Yeah. And then I get a cut of each record's profits. It's generally translated to somewhere around 60 cents on every record sold. Really? I got to pay back a half a million dollars wow. off of my 60 cents. Yeah. So even though the record may generate a, a return, Yeah, it may actually generate a return, but because the way that their bean counters conduct the math, <laughs> it doesn't ever get out of the red. Interesting, huh. But nowadays I'm making records for a shoestring, uh, for a fraction of what we used to make records for. And they sound the same, right? And yeah. we, the, the, hopefully the quality hasn't diminished at all. And, uh, and, and you know, like I said, we're, we're turning, we're getting into the black selling 2,500 records. Yeah. But if we could get over that 10,000 mark, uh, we'd be able to have a lot more freedom. I'd be able to start carrying a, a bigger band on tour. You know, uh -huh. there's just some things that that money would be able to do to, to help uh, overall. Uh, and, 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 you know, I would have to stop seeking investors to fund records because I still don't have enough cash flow yeah. to pay for my own records. There's still some things that we're working out. And, and, and we're definitely on the right track. But, uh, you know, hopefully... As things move forward, <clears throat> we're gonna figure out a whole lot more about this business that we that we don't quite know yet. How does being someone on on the on the the trajectory you're on, um, it it 
I had a question to ask you about your family and whether you had gone in to start a family th knowing you were going to have a big family. It doesn't sound no, like that was the case. Not at all. How are you balancing and what are the difficulties when you have two things that are going on the same trajectory? Your family and your career are both growing. Mm -hmm. What's the dichotomy there of how much time do you spend at home and how much time do you get out? Is that like the toughest struggle? It's that a difficult struggle, no doubt. I think for a long time the biggest issue was that I viewed my life as two separate lives. That I had this road life and then I had this home life. And it wasn't until I brought those two under the same roof and started to really uh, uh, participate in the home life on a much deeper level while I was out on the road. And technology has made that a lot easier. Yeah. Video chatting, you know, if I look in straight into the camera, it looks like I'm looking into your eyes when you're I, looking at the camera. Yeah. And, and so when I'm looking at my kid on FaceTime after he's been a jerk to his mama, <laughs> I'm like, boy, when I get home, I'm yeah. going to whip your ass. <laughs> and he believes it, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I don't do long tours much anymore. We used to go out for long stretches, like a month, a month, two months, yeah. back to back. You know, I'd come home for three days and go out for another month. And, and honestly, the economics of touring work better when you're on tour for a long Constantly. time. Constantly, yeah. But... Uh, we, we go out for no more than about two weeks these days. We'll stretch it out to a month if necessary, but it's not fun to do. Yeah. At three weeks, your soul starts to die. Exactly, right? At four weeks, you basically are a shell of a man. And you, you, you can, at that point, you know, I feel no love. I feel no emotion in my body anymore. And I could stay on tour forever. Does that affect the performance ever? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know if it, if, if, I'd have to really think hard about that. Because I would say this, we did a, at this venue you're playing tonight, Southport Hall, we did a, 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 an event a couple of weeks ago for a good friend of ours, Dave Rosser. Yeah. And I was telling some people that were here, I felt like it was the best performance I had ever seen Mark Broussard give. Mm. The band, the whole deal. Yeah. Now granted, maybe I've seen you a dozen times. No, it was a fun show you play, And it, I was thinking that you were on another level. Your yeah. intensity level was up there, and I'm sure it had something to do with it being about a good friend in yeah. Devo. How, is it hard to keep up that intensity on a regular basis? Well, look, we're talking about, you know, what I do uh, is, is very reliant on my vocal health. Yeah. And even if, if I'm in peak form, there are days that are just not going to be as good as others. Yeah. You know what I mean? Some, day, some days you just don't have it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and those are the most difficult times when, when vocally I can't exactly do what I was able to do last night. It's frustrating as all get out. Yeah. Uh, luckily, I've surrounded myself with unbelievable musicians for my entire career. And that was... Which make things quite easy on me. What does it take to be in Mark Broussard's band? Do you have to be a total badass, or do you have to be a badass and a great hang? Right, a, like you definitely have to have the hang. Right, like I, I've I've definitely let guys go because their hang was not right, because they might and they were still badasses. They were badasses, yeah, but but you know they might say something to a gal after the show, and uh, that a girl you know a girl doesn't want to go back to the, the hotel with the guy and. And he, he calls her a bitch or something. And no matter what, your and name's that's, attached to that's that. That's the kind of stuff that's not going to fly. Because right. um, what is... Musicianship is, is, is key, too, though. I mean, you have to be performing at a high level of musicianship to be in this band. You can't be a scrub, you know? It's not a... This is not a, a slouch's gig. Would you say your most recent addition is Joe? Joe Stark? Joe's... Actually, the base, on bass is the newest addition. Joe's been in and out of the band for years. Is so. he a permanent member now? He's 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 got the chair as long as he wants the chair. Man, I'll tell you this. It's my I think personally for me, y'all sound the best when yeah. Joe is. I up love there. having him. I, I, I love Joe. He's not necessarily the most technically proficient guitarist I've ever had. Yeah. Um, but he is a star. It, and agreed. when I point to him. He takes over the stage, and I really get to step back and get a breath of fresh air. I even see y'all are playing some of his music now. We are, man. I, I'm a huge fan of his stuff. Yeah, me, me huge too. Huge fan. I was, th to see him out there and to see the group you have now, 
Um, it really made me happy because what happens, I don't even know if you notice it, when people have a stint in your band, they end up flourishing elsewhere. Yeah. Jason Parfait, yeah. your saxophone player, never heard of him. Saw him playing with you, all of a sudden he's got his own deal and he's getting booked. And Well, I think you know, that probably has a lot to do with the fact that I, I, I'm a, what has been described as a musician's musician. Yeah. Uh, generally, other musicians... Uh, whether it, whether they're jazz or folk or rock or uh, funk or whatever it is, we play well to those kinds of guys yeah. and, and gals. And so, um, you know, if you're a musician in the crowd, you, you can take a look at the stage and see a whole stage full of badass. Yeah, it, <laughs> which is me. great. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> no, I think and, I think you're doing all right. And bro. so, you know, oftentimes what'll happen is, you know, a younger artist that's in the crowd. We'll see that band, and when they go to cut their record, they just make the call and say, "I want Mark's, I want Mark's band." That's a that's a good point, huh? Well, one thing that is, uh, I'm, if you've watched a little bit of Wine and Cheese or listened to it, I like to know about the stuff I'm interested in. One thing that interests me a lot about you and your family is your dad, mm. your dad Ted. Um, he is in the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame, correct? Because he was in a band called the Boogie Kings, right? And I'm sure he was in a lot of other projects. Oh, no doubt. And I see to this day he comes out and plays with you, and it seems like he's still on his A game. Was that pressure growing up? It was, significantly, but only in respect to guitar. Because his guitar prowess was, was on display from a very early age. Yeah. Uh, and because my natural abilities vocally uh, were, were, you know, were where they were at, at childhood, um, I just gravitated away from the guitar, away really? from the discipline that it took, because singing came so naturally. Uh, I, 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 I mean, he told me what it took to get as good as him. It took six hours of practice in every single day. Ten thousand hours. Yeah, <laughs> man. And and guess what? I wasn't into that at all. I can already sing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got I got the singing thing down. I'm a, I'll just play enough so I can write. Um, but he was never. Uh, forceful with me at all. He always wanted to foster uh, any lane that I wanted to take. And uh, there was definitely a time where they, my parents both thought about maybe taking me to Disney World and seeing if there would be some fit for me there. And, uh, and, and the, wise, the wise choice was made that my ego was already so overinflated <laughs> that maybe it was better for me to hold off. To be a solo thing. Yeah. Well, because you know that there's it's, I wouldn't say well-known, but there are people who would say that you are a once-in-a-lifetime vocal or vocalist, or you've got a vocal style and sound that doesn't come around. It's very unusual. They hold you up, your fans and people that know you, hold you up to a really high standard. What's it like having that type of praise heap, heaped onto you as, oh, well, you're this vocal that, vocalist that... There's never been one like you before. Yeah. You know, well, look, that, the what's truth it like? of the matter is I, I try to temper all of those comments uh, with, with an understanding that, that, you know, when folks compare you to their favorite singer, mm -hmm. they're, they're putting you in, into their, their best catalog, right? Yeah. They're, they're, so no matter who that they might be comparing me to, if, if they compare me to somebody that I don't necessarily think is a great singer, but as this person's favorite singer, I take it as a compliment. Okay. So that's for starters. Yeah. Secondly, I, I also personally am a fan of music. Yeah. And, and I'm not delusional. I know singers personally that sing circles around me. And so I take those kinds of Name comments. Name one of them. Nigel Hall, Michael not Kilgore, uh, Tone A. And what uh, is it that these people do better? Because from, from a fan's point of view, it's hard for me to look and see somebody that would be that much better than you because I don't see it. I see you as the man, and what is it that they do differently So technically, or better? Technically, they are more uh, accomplished. Um, they can do things vocally that I can't do vocally. They, they've got a bag of tricks that is bigger than my bag of tricks. Gotcha. Um, I still, to this day, can't tell you why people like... I mean, I know that I sing well. Mm -hmm. I know that I sing in key, and then I, you know, I have uh, a unique-sounding voice and whatnot, but... I still can't quite put my finger on why it is that people think that I'm 
the greatest or one of the greatest or whatever. I don't. I have no idea because once again, I know tons of singers that sing circles around me. I think it's. I think that's originality. I think that's when. when I, people, I would hope so. When people see something and hear something that maybe they've never heard before, I think that's, you know, because they can look at go see a Mark Broussard show and hear this this voice come out of this box. I would hope so. You've never seen anything like that before, maybe. Right. No doubt. But um, what it what it does sometimes early on, especially. It, it's I call it the Tiger Woods syndrome. You know, you told it all your life that you're perfect. Right, that's, and, and that's what I was getting at. Yeah, you, you told know. all your life that you're perfect, and, and it definitely uh, sent me down a very self-centered path. Uh, but luckily uh, for me, I, I got married to a, a really <laughs> great gal who let me know exactly where I stood. Exactly, uh, yeah. That none of the music mattered anymore when it came time to come home. This is where I stand. And so that kind of gave me a real serious reality check. And, uh, you know, obviously the guys I have on the road as well aren't afraid to call me on my bullshit. And you need and, that. And I need, you I need needed that. it for a long time. I needed it. And, yeah. and luckily, uh, I was able to, to kind of come back down to earth and realize that, you know, I'm not much different than anybody else. So we talked about you being the independent artist and you were with labels forever. I, w preparing for the interview, I went back and we're looking at some things you did in the past and I thought I saw some videos and songs that looked like something that was not your idea and you didn't do, but you took place in it anyway. Specifically, um, there's a song, Only Everything. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten what you think is some bad advice or some bad direction from le record labels in the past that you think maybe has set you back? I wouldn't necessarily call their efforts misplaced, but what I would say is that at, at the, the earliest phases of my career and, and well into it, um, I had no vision. I had no artistic vision. I, I viewed the record deal as a destination as opposed to an opportunity. Gotcha. I thought that I had arrived and that there was a guy in the building with a phone that, you know, could call up Johnny Carson and Ed Sullivan. Yeah. Which it existed in those days. Yeah. It no longer exists. Yeah. They don't have those power phones that get the head of the <laughs> entire radio network. It's kind of, it uh, seems like the power yeah. is now in the artist's hands. It, it, it always has been. That, and that's the thing that, I, that I've realized more and more <clears throat> is that without a vision, my vision was dictated to me by right. others. And you ex they and, don't exist without you. You exist no matter what. That's not, that's not necessarily true because they, they kept their jobs after I got dropped. Yeah. They all, those strategies that they developed on my behalf were all failed strategies, and yet they all kept their six-figure jobs in their Manhattan apartments. Yeah. Uh, my stock is the one that, that significantly dropped. But most importantly, when this vision was dictated to me by these people, it was dictated by people that were professionals in the music business that had gold and platinum records on their walls. Yeah. So there was nothing to tell me that what they were telling me was bad. Okay, there was no... There was no idea no or track indicator record to, yeah. that, that, that was suggested that their advice was bad. Um, and I also had managers at the time who, uh, who had told me about stories with, with previous artists that they had worked with who had sabotaged their own careers by uh, too forcefully fighting for certain things. And Understood. so the advice from them was to pick and choose my battles. Yeah. And I did that very well for a while. But once again, it comes back to not having that artistic vision. And, and what it translated to was a, uh, was a very thin, uh, very skin-deep attempt at uh, market success. And my gotcha. fans saw right through it. Exactly, right? You see it and you go, that's not him. Exactly. That's, some, that's some outside influence. Yep. Well, we got a couple more minutes, man. There's two quick things I want to touch on uh, uh, before we wrap up. One... Um, I love your social media, man. I think that there's one thing that you've got over uh, some other people that maybe you're competing with is you're just hilarious on social media. Oh, good. We're gonna we're gonna tag everything, all of your social media outlets when we release Killer. the interview. Um, but there's there's a couple of videos that I saw towards the beginning of this year or, or, or end of last year that really intrigued me. What's your deal with cutting the grass, man? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> What's the deal? Man, it, I, I would love nothing more than the Forrest Gump the hell out <laughs> in retirement, bro. Right? I didn't, you know, usually people would ask you, well, if you weren't a musician, what would you be doing? Cutting I grass. think I know. I I'd think you would grass. be cutting grass. Absolutely. What is it about this, the process? I, 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 first of all, I love machinery, yeah. you know, and, and, and sitting on a machine like that, you just kind of, you feel powerful. You feel kind of manly. I, I also uh, tend to, to write songs to the hum of the engine. That's, um, I, I'm a big Howard Stern fan. And yeah. he's had a couple of guys on recently, two that pop out of my head, Willie Nelson and Pharrell. Mm. And they both said being in a vehicle and driving is when they write all of their best stuff. Absolutely, man. Right? So do you find yourself writing while you're cutting? All the time. <laughs> Constantly. Dude, that's, that's awesome. I, I, it's just a very peaceful place for me. Yeah. It's a very, very peaceful place for me. I don't know why I like cutting grass so much, but I do. <laughs> hey, if you're in Mark's neighborhood or you're around the corner, come holla at him. Oh, dude, I cut my neighbor's yard. <laughs> I weed eat. I blow it off. I cut my other neighbor's yard. I cut my mom and daddy's yard. I cut my brother's yard. I've heard about this. <laughs> and I don't charge. Yeah. Well, there's something about seeing a freshly cut lawn. I love it. That gives you some type of accomplishment. I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, look, we got... It's December 23rd. It seems like you're going to be trying to play a show at Southport every around year. every Christmas. Yeah, I'd hopefully. like to be back here again next year and sit down, talk Absolutely, to you, man. and Let's see where it. you're at. Let's set some goals. I'm curious, and I think your fans are curious. For Mark Broussard, what is the goal? Where do you want to be at this time next year compared to where you're at? Maybe one or two things. What are you specifically going after um, that you want to accomplish by this time next year? Well, that's a pretty involved question that I, I that I could that I could go quite deep into. Yeah. What I will say is that there's a hole in the social media world. Uh, the social media platforms are driven by musicians, and yet there's very little incentive for creators like myself to actually engage. Yeah. Facebook limits who I can reach. Mm -hmm. through engagement. Twitter is now starting to do the same thing. And uh, <clears throat> there's, there's nothing from Facebook or Twitter. They're not coming to guys like me and creators generally and saying, hey, come to our platform and create and we will give you something in exchange. Yeah. It, it's something as simple as who is engaging. Yeah. Who is engaging in my posts? Yeah. And where do they live? What are their email addresses? Who are these fans of mine that, I'm not that I might not know directly? Yeah. And how can I how can I market to them more effectively? Yeah. Uh, and this is all business stuff, and I don't like talking yeah. on camera about the business stuff. But that's okay. I, I'm an artist, and I, I want to be. I'm an interested artist, in okay? it. Okay, but the truth is, is that uh, I'm I'm currently in the process of building a new platform that will be uh, a place for artists to come. Really? And, and yeah, like a Players Tribune is for professional athletics. So that's a big goal I'm, for. I'm I'm in the process right now. We'll, we'll hopefully be live. Uh, with a landing page at the very least uh, in February, and then uh, and start to put out some content uh, in in March and, and moving into the summertime. So it's a it's a very serious goal of mine to build a a, a place for artists to come and leverage their collect their their respective fan bases uh, for the collective, so that we can all start to participate in this network. Well, I'd say that's a pretty solid goal, man. Yeah, I'm excited well, about it. That's awesome. Well. This has been Wine and Cheese, y'all. This is my band, Mark Broussard. Uh, if you know who he is, continue to support. If you don't, I'm telling you, get on this train, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> um, because it's a good-ass time, man. It, your music, it. Your music really makes me feel good. Good. Um, I, 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 I've told your, your drummer and your tour manager, Chad, before, I hate flying, so whenever I fly, it's Mark Broussard in the head because <laughs> nice. the, live, the live record from Full Sail is the one that I always go to when I got to fly. Um, he's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everywhere. Oh, he's 95,000, 94,000 likes on Facebook. Let's get him to 100,000, man. It. Let's get them six figures in there. And I'm yeah, telling baby. you, we've had some success with some people in the past getting their numbers up, so we're going to help them out. Appreciate um, it. Anything else you want to touch on before, before we no, get out of here, No, man, y'all uh, be looking for the new record when it comes out in March. 
I'll be on tour with the Southern Soul Assembly. That's me, J.J. Gray, Anders Osborne, and Luther Dickinson. Yeah. Uh, in March. Um, and, uh, yeah, keep in touch. Sign up for the mailing list on my website. I just launched a blog, which is up on my website as well, markbrucer.com. We'll share that, too. on the. And we're always on tour, so come out to see us at the show. Well, awesome. Thank you all, everybody. Mr. Mark Brusaw, thank you, you, my friend. Take care, brother. Y'all have a good one. one. We'll talk to you then. Yeah.